Good afternoon and welcome to my talk with title A Sensitivity Analysis on Energy Technology Costs. The talk is based on the results of a study published in the journal Energy. I will start off with some observations. So we see that well below 2 degrees pathways usually require carbon dioxide removal, which in turn exhibits highly uncertain potential. At the same time, in the energy sector, which is responsible for the biggest part of emissions, we see rapidly falling costs of renewable energy sources. An example is that in many world regions, the current levelized cost of electricity is smaller than the long-run marginal cost of coal power plants, which means basically it is cheaper to start a new renewable capacity from scratch than keep the old coal capacities running. But despite that, um, in terms of sectors, transport and industry are more difficult to decarbonize than the buildings and the power sector. And summarizing these, we have the following research questions that we would like to address. So we would like to see what the influences of energy supply side costs on the depth and economics of decarbonization. We would like to see this broken down in economic sectors like buildings, industry, transport and the power sector. And we want to measure the relative sensitivity of important mitigation indicators on these technology costs. Finally, in terms of the IMC community and sensitivity analysis on energy technology costs is interesting for us as a community. So the methods that we are going to be using will be listed here. Um, we will do sensitivity analysis using a large scale energy economy model, the model Remind, which analyzes optimal pathways to reach climate targets. We will measure the relative importance of the cost of technologies of energy supply across economic sectors and derive the sensitivity of global mitigation indicators such as with methods such as uh, Sobol and Workanovo indices. To broaden the solution space, we will also look into two more dimensions. We will consider cases with and without carbon dioxide removal and with increasing levels of policy stringency. Now, um, the, input, the inputs of uh, the sensitivity analysis, which are called factors, will be energy technology costs. So we will be looking at renewable energy technology costs. We will be looking at nuclear power plant capital costs. Now for the fossil fuels and biofuels, we are uh, not looking at capital costs, but uh, cost curves for extraction. Then uh, we will also be looking at different levels of uh, injection rates for carbon capture and storage. And finally, from the demand side, we will be looking at cost of battery, battery electric vehicles and hydrogen powered fuel cell cars. So once we have uh, seen uh, what factors we are going to be looking at, we want to see what the uncertainty ranges are of these factors. These are shown here and of course I will not go into the details. Um, I will just show a few remarks. Um, so the values shown here are um, world average, but there is a regional variation taking place. And um, it has to be mentioned also that these ranges are policy specific. And here we are showing the uh, values for a way below the degrees policy scenario. The reason for this is that uh, there are learn effects happening. So a few further remarks. The extraction costs of fossil fuels are based on SSP scenarios. Then the variation in this, the carbon capture and sequestration injection rate um, is shown here and it has a highly uncertain potential. 
And finally, for the so-called learning technologies, we are observing strong short-term declines and then flattening in towards the mid of the century. Now, once we have uh, looked at the uncertainty in inputs, uh, let's see how this uncertainty is transformed into variation in um, outputs. So here we look at the scenario ensemble, which visualizes the whole exercise. So um, we are listing all our policy scenarios, which are ranging from a baseline scenario then to the NDC case, which is the continuation of the Paris pledges, and then three deep decarbonization scenarios um, ranging from a well below 2 degrees to a 1.5 degree scenarios. Um, we also have a variation that is not well shown here due to the resolution uh, between considering carbon dioxide removal and no carbon dioxide removal. And in each of the variables shown in these graphs on the right, we are showing with vertical lines the uncertainty range in the year 2100. What uh, can also be seen is that without carbon dioxide removal, the uncertainty range is being decreased. Now moving on to how we quantify the contribution of each of the input, inputs to the variation in these outputs. We start off with showing the uh, reference values. So when all factors are kept at their best guess value, we uh, will be looking at three um, variables, um, the average CO2 emissions, the electricity share of final energy, which is a measure of the electrification of a sector, and then uh, as an inverse measure of electrification, we will be looking at the fossil, uh, fossil carbon intensity of fuels. And this, we are listing it for each of the economic sectors. And for each sector, a, a horizontal black line shows the sensitivity range from the variation in the inputs. So zooming in into these sensitivity ranges, first we have the results for the total values. And we are listing the uh, factors uh, not as it is being done usually uh, by uh, the most important contribution, um, but by clustering them in terms of uh, colors, as we see here. So we have renewables, nuclear, low carbon mobility, bioenergy, and CCS and fossils, each shown with a different background color to be distinguished from each other. So once we have the total, we can also look at the uh, breakdown in the sectors first of the demand side and then adding also the supply side we look at electricity. Um, here the direction and magnitude of the effect of each factor is shown but if we want to quantify the overall effect we can compute the so-called Sobol indices and also the Borgonova indices that we are not showing here, with which we can have a, an overview of uh, the most important factors in this sensitivity analysis. So we are listing the uh, five mitigation indicators, um, the fossil carbon intensity of fuels in the final energy, the uh, gross fossil fuel and industry CO2 emissions, policy costs, price uh, price of car uh, carbon prices and um, accumulated carbon dioxide removal demands. This we do for the baseline, the NDC, and the uh, budget uh, well below 2 degree scenario. Um, 
And what we observe here from the color coding is uh, the transition from a low effect of uh, electromobility and oil, which is increasing with policy stringency, the same way that the effect of renewables is decreasing with increasing policy stringency. This for renewables doesn't 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 mean that they have a they play a minor role, but rather that. Uh, in the power sector, the substitutability of options is important, is high. So to summarize and draw some conclusions, the stronger variation uh, is seen to be originating from bioenergy and CCS, but also from energy intensity, but uh, uh, transport related. This makes the transport being the marginal sector between the sectors the one setting the costs and the prices. The year of carbon neutrality is largely unaffected by the variation in technology costs, which uh, means that the emissions have to reach zero by the mid-century. And the high overall influence of biomass and CCS, which have uncertain potential, and transport-related technologies, which are difficult to decarbonize, highlights the need for robust policy support to achieve a fast transition. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, well, unfortunately, at the beginning, the quality wasn't as good, so we haven't seen uh, the, the beginning of the presentation. Uh, but we have a couple questions coming in, and uh, Anastasis, hopefully you are somewhere. Uh, I cannot see your video, but please indicate that you can hear me. I am here. Perfect. Okay, so uh, uh, we have a couple questions. Uh, the first question uh, is you've shown uh, the bar uh, where, uh, if uh, the understanding is correct, you're showing share of electricity in the electricity sector. Can you elaborate on that or uh, confirm that that's the right understanding or what's the meaning of that? Mm, there is no such bar. If you notice the graph uh, in both the panel with the reference values and the panel below with the sensitivities for the electricity share in the electricity sector, the bar is missing and the plot is missing. So maybe okay. maybe uh, Felix has misread the, the graph. Well, it was easy to misread <laughs> any graphs in this quality, sorry. Uh, and, uh, uh, there is a, uh, also a question from Felix. Uh, uh, the Sobel indicator of the sensitivity uh, uh, was quite high for hydrogen uh, mm. in certain metrics. So can you elaborate on that? Well, this is not only hydrogen. Um, so with uh, ELH2, we are uh, defining battery electric vehicles and hydrogen-powered fuel cell cars. And... Um, this, in essence, is one of the main findings of the paper, that the transport is the sector rela uh, uh, defining the prices. So we name it the marginal sector because of the huge contribution transport-related technologies have on all the indicators that we are looking at, which are costs, emissions, uh, carbon dioxide removal demands. So the, the transport's effect is higher than the one uh, of um, uh, technology spinning into buildings and um, industry sector. Thank you. Uh, so those who just join, and I see that we have a much bigger attendance uh, in comparison to the beginning of the session. So one more time, the reminder uh, is please use Q&A. Uh, you can use both Q&A and chat, uh, but it, for me, it's a little bit easier to uh, follow just one tab. So uh, if you can type your questions in Q&A, that will be easier. Uh, two, uh, we have a slight change in order. Uh, so K1 uh, and Camille, uh, they switch the presentations. And so hopefully the quality of this video is going to be a little bit better. Uh, and uh, I already uh, gave an instruction to all the speakers, so please uh, kind of uh, be on the backstage or press that uh, uh, red phone button when you are not presenting. So despite the instructions which we got before, that apparently improved the quality quite substantially. Uh, we have one more question, so uh, maybe uh, if you can just type the answer, uh, if that's a brief answer, or if you follow up with Elena uh, with that question, uh, for the sake of time, let's move to our second presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, this is very interesting. 
Uh, and now we are going to try to start uh, the second video for uh, Camille Oliveira. And I'm typing the instructions to the technical support team. And we are going to hear about the role of biomaterials, hopefully in, in a moment. Good afternoon, I'm Camila Oliveira from COPE, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and I will present now our work on the role of biomaterials in a Brazilian integrated assessment module. Um, this presentation was based in three scientific papers, and then you can assess them on the bottom of the slides. Um, integrated assessment modules indicate biomass as an essential energy carrier to reduce G to G emissions in the global energy systems. However, few IAMs represent the possibility of co-producing energy carriers and feedstock. Most of the studies have dealt with biomass conversion from the perspective of the energy food dilemma, simplifying its use for chemical conversion. Here, we bring the concept of the biomass trilemma into the Brazilian IAM, the BLUES model, to explore the biomass competition between energy, food, and materials. So basically, there are two different scenarios for the use of biomass in materials. It can grow, for example, with electrification of urban mobility that would lead to surpluses of automotive fuels such as ethanol. This ethanol could be repurposed to chemical conversion as an alternative market. Also, the chemical demand is expected to grow in an energy transition scenarios to produce lightweight materials. For example, lightweight plastics can be used in wind turbines to increase generation efficiency. On the other hand, the use of biomass could decline since it is limited by land availability and it has to be consistent with avoiding deforestation and biodiversity loss, as is stated in the SDG. So our question is, what is the role of biomass in climate mitigation scenarios when considering biomass competitions for energy, foods and chemicals in an integrated manner? So for that, we included technologies in the BLUES model, technologies to produce fossil-based petrochemicals and bio-based drop-in petrochemicals, such as ethylene, propylene, butadine, and BDX. So we included the demand for each one of these basic petrochemicals. We considered only bio-based drop-in petrochemicals because we wanted to assess petrochemical produced at large scales that could significantly reduce GHG emissions. So we considered steam cracking, propane dehydrogenation, propane splitter, catalytic reforming, methanol to ethanol, uh, methanol to aromatic, ethanol dehydration, but we also considered um, technologies that would produce biofuels, but also co-produce feedstocks for petrochemical production. For example, BTL, biomass to liquids, that aims to produce green diesel uh, or green jet fuel, but also produces green NAFTA and green LPG that is feedstock for petrochemical production. So for each technology, uh, we added the capital cost, the operational maintenance cost, the products wield, the existing capacity, the additional capacity, uh, the steam, fuel electricity consumption and we assumed the oil price constant as $50 per barrel for the whole period from 2010 to 2050. Scenarios, we considered uh, business as usual scenarios, which is a reference case for basic petrochemical demand. Uh, we considered a well below two scenario consistent with the Paris Agreement uh, and Brazil would have a budget of 14 gigatons of CO2. We also considered the scenario with a demand reduction of plastics consistent with the clean technology scenario of uh, International Energy Agency, which considers um, uh, increasing rate of mechanical recycling and phasing out single-use plastics. And we also considered a, a scenario with um, with cement and steel substitution by plastics in construction. So uh, substitution of 10% of cement and steel by plastics in a volume proportion of one to one. So we assess that uh, to understand if, if the biogenic carbon in the biogenic carbon stored in a bio-based plastic for hundreds of years uh, in the construction could lead to negative emissions in the end. 
So as final disposal options, we assumed long lifetime material. So the, the, the carbon will be stored for decades until its degradability. Landfill would also have the same climate impact because we will also store, store the, the carbon. Incineration would release the carbon stored and recycling, of course, leads to, to emission due to uh, electricity consumption for the, for the process. So result, um, we have the, the biofuel production. So um, ethanol use fuel, ethanol fuel use grows until 2035, but in, from 2040 onwards, ethanol use decreases due to mobility electrification, being compensated by ethanol deployment for petrochemical production. Um, so the increase in the in the production of biofuels in 2050 that we can see in the graph is significantly driven by the adoption of biomass to liquids technology with CCS that are used primarily in the transportation sector. So uh, thereby diesel from BTL technology, the, the green diesel is the most important biofuel reaching 43% of the total biofuel production. Ethanol uh, with CCS reaches 17% and green jet fuel reaches 16%. And what is interesting to hear, to, to see here, is that the increase in biofuel production does not lead to deforestation uh, in the second graph that shows the cumulative land use change. So in the well below two in 2050, there's no degraded pack pasture. Actually, there is negative emissions from, from afforestation and also from agriculture, forestry and land use. Um, on the other hand, in 2015, the baseline scenario, there is increases degraded pasture. It's, uh, it's increased from 23 million hectares in 2050 to 66 uh, million hectares by 2050. Uh, this graph shows the bio-based petrochemical production. Uh, we see that in 2015, in the well below two, uh, bio-based petrochemical reaches 33% of the total petrochemical production in Brazil. Uh, also, 21% of the naphtha in the same kraken is bio-based, that is the green naphtha co-produced by the BTL technologies with CCS. Um, and also electrification and urban mobility boosts ethanol use for ethylene and butadiene production. So in 2050, 61% of ethanol use is used for petrochemical. Um, this slide shows uh, the ethylene, propylene, BDX, and butadiene production. We can see that naphtha steam cracking is still is the, the dominant technology, is the, is the, the blue bar, but 20 21% of this naphtha and steam cracking is biobased. We can also see that for ethylene, uh, the use of ethanol to produce ethylene reaches 19% in 2050, and in butadine, in, in for butadine production, it reaches 20%. Also, methanol to olefin. Uh, reaches 7% of the total ethylene production and reaches 10% of the total propylene production. Also in the propylene production, we can see that a propane splitter reaches 8.5%. And if we see the BDX production, the aromatic production, um, catalytic reforming reaches 30% of the total BDX production in 2050. Um, the net, the, the negative emissions from bio-based petrochemicals in long lifetime materials reaches 170 megatons of CO2 accumulated in the whole period from 2010 to 2050. It is just 1.7% of the total nets, including Bax and Afolu. But if we see the impacts of, of biomaterials and the petroleum refineries, we have even more uh, avoided emissions. So, um, the refining utilization rates uh, dropped from 2040 to 2050 from 90% to 13% in the Southeast region. In the South region, uh, the refiners were closed and in the North and Northeast region, it kept an average refining utilization rate of 85%. Um, so the refining throughput in 2040 was 1.8 megabarrels per day, and it dropped to 0.5 megabarrels per day. So the avoided emissions uh, was 18 megatons of CO2. And if we sum the avoided emissions from liquid fuel combustions, it is 162 megatons of CO2. So in total, 
the side effects on petroleum refineries summed 180 megatons of CO2 only in 2050, which is higher than the net achieved in the whole period that it was 170 megatons of CO2 through storing carbon in long lifetime materials. Um, this graph shows the cumulative CO2 emissions difference between the well below two scenario and then derived scenarios, the, the plastic demand reduction, the cement substitution and the steel substitution scenarios. Uh, we can see here that the, the biggest difference is in the in, in industrial emissions. It's the, the red bar. Um, so since this scenario has uh, less plastic demand, it, it has also less industrial emissions from the, the petrochemical sector. Um, but when we see also the, the steel substitution sa um, scenario, we can see there's a, a gray bar, it's, it's the emissions from the industrial processes. And then we don't see that in the cement substitution because the well below two, it already considers the deployment of CCS in the cement plants and not in the steel plants. So in the well below two, there is already less uh, industrial emissions from cement. So there, there isn't a big difference between the well below two and the well below two with the cement substitution. But it, it's, it has a difference in the steel substitution scenario. And when we see the net, uh, they have the three scenarios has similar nets. It's uh, 599 for demand reduction, 566 for the cement, and 578 for the steel substitution. No conclusions. Uh, without addressing materials, there is no rapid food transition from fossil fuels as required by the more stringent climate ambitions. Biobased petrochemicals account for one third of the total petrochemical production. Uh, a transition in the energy system, for example, electrification of our mobility, could generate surpluses that could serve as feedstock for material production. In 2040, um, ethanol is repurposed for material production, compensating for the fuel market loss. Uh, the production of biofuels in a climate constraint scenario could also generate coal products to produce bio-based materials, so the biomass trilemma did not affect uh, land use change emissions. Uh, the emergency of biorefineries led to the reduction of petro petroleum refined utilization rates, leading to a reduction of 180 megatons of CO2 in 2050. And uh, one of the uncertainties of this modeling exercise is the oil price assumed of $50 per barrel throughout the whole period. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good. Uh, uh, I think we had uh, a lot of learning by doing. Uh, I see that that concept uh, really works. So in the first video, we've learned how to mute ourselves and improve the quality. In the second video, we actually moved the bars that we can see the whole video. Uh, so one more time, uh, those of you who are joining late, uh, uh, well, and I see more and more people are uh, coming in. Uh, well, I guess uh, the United States part uh, of the audience is start waking up. Uh, so uh, uh, we had a switch uh, in the order. Uh, so those of you who thought that they missed K1 stock, no, you haven't yet. Uh, but uh, a reminder, uh, use Q&A uh, for the questions uh, and you can see that the offers can uh, answer. Uh, if we cannot uh, handle that uh, uh, live, uh, then that's an opportunity for you to follow up with the speakers. Um, so uh, I have a question, Camille. Uh, if I understood correctly, uh, well, one of the findings that you have a substantial increase in biofuels production, but not that much impact on deforestation. Is that correct? And if yes, uh, why is that? What is driving that? And I cannot hear you. Probably. You know, are you Can you hear now? Somewhere? Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Uh, what happened is that the model doesn't choose to dedicate land for the production of biomaterials. What happened is that they choose to produce uh, biomass to liquids with CCS uh, to, to meet the requirements for transportation. So the model wants to produce synthetic fuels for transportation. And the, the, the NAFTA, the green NAFTA, is a co-product of this. So it, it's, the, it's the concept of biorefinery. It produces biofuels and also uh, biofeedstock. So, so it's a really efficient uh, process 
and then you don't need a dedicated land to produce a biomaterial. So that's why it doesn't impact oh. the emissions from land use. Okay, very interesting. Okay, uh, one more time, uh, I encourage uh, to use Q&A. They will be able to follow up on that and that will be available, uh, I think not only for this session, but later. So that's really a useful uh, feature. So uh, because we are pressed on time, so maybe we will go to the next presentation. And I'm, I'm particularly looking forward for this presentation because it's about okay. hydrogen, which is a very hot topic. So everybody is trying to get the answers. So please give us answers. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, okay, I'm trying to answer the question from Sergey that uh, the rule of hydrogen in the 1.5 degree pathways in China, that's uh, what we are, we are doing right now. Uh, so basically idea, we are, what we are doing is to follow the IPCC special report on 1.5 degree warming. That means the lowest one uh, from the global uh, emission pathways. But we pick up uh, our uh, carbon budget for China uh, based on the Engage uh, City Link and the COMET project. We work together with many colleagues here. So to think about what's the future for China. And uh, actually from uh, 19, uh, 2017, we are working hardly on the two degree and 1.5 degree scenario for China because uh, we really want to put this into China's middle century strategy targets uh, because uh, there are a lot of discussion in the last two years what to do for China's 2050 emission control. So the above three line, what we did is the money we, we did before, uh, actually it's for Copenhagen <laughs> agreement. Uh, but finally, the peaking uh, CO2 emission around 2030 appeared in Paris uh, Agreement. Uh, but actually, from after 2012, we're also working hardly on the two degree for China, uh, which means uh, China should peak before uh, 2025. That's the, the, the major reason why China commit to be uh, peaking uh, around uh, before 2030. So, but uh, for the carbon neutral one, uh, we work with our model. Uh, I also had to thank uh, many colleagues here, like Kiwa and other colleagues. We worked together for the last <laughs> several years. This is a scenario what we did for the IPEC model for China. This is uh, focusing on the 1.5 degree scenario. Uh, and also hydrogen scenarios a pick up based on these uh, pictures. Uh, but good news is, uh, uh, when we did the scenario for China's two degree emission pathway, we did a lot of internal discussion with the policymakers. It's almost okay for them to pick up with that one. But one, once we look at the 1.5 degree scenario, we didn't see much difference between the energy, primary energy mix with the one in two degrees. So this is quite good news. That means energy transition anyway is going ahead. Uh, even for the power generation uh, uh, scenarios, uh, some difference among the Chinese modelers. For example, our scenario use a lot of nuclear power uh, when we think about the system cost for electric supply, what we did for that one. We also use a lot of biomass scenario uh, in order to use the BE success here in China, make a, finally the power generation to be negative emission by 2050. That's the lower picture you can see. This is uh, our energy transition scenario. But uh, now what I mentioned about is uh, we also have very strong driving force in the coming several years, actually also in the last, uh, in the past uh, seven years, what we did very good job of air quality control. And this is uh, so far the major driving force for China's energy transition. And we did, make a very good story and uh, uh, the target for the air quality improvement is getting to be reached. And uh, uh, it hopefully uh, maybe by 2030, we can go uh, to the national standard. And also by 2050, we go to the uh, WHO standard for air, air quality control. Then by following with this one, uh, our funding is when we start to run a scenario for uh, 1.5 degree pathways, we suddenly found that there actually a big transition for economy, which means uh, we have to pick up many sectors, which is originally very difficult 
to make a deep cut of CO2 emission. For example, still making ammonia, uh, benzene, ethylene, methanol, clinker, and highway duty transport airplane. So what happened with that one? So our funding is, uh, yes, we have to go to hydrogen-based. This is quite similar with the EU's roadmap for the uh, 2050 climate neutral emission pathways. This is also something we learned from our European colleagues to do the hydrogen based. But in our modeling accesses, we mainly focus on these sectors, what we did for the hydrogen demand. This is scenario, what, what, what we did. Uh, maybe by 2050 in China, we, we need a little bit more than uh, 50 million ton of hydrogen. And uh, you can also see from these pictures, for different sectors uh, where we will use the hydrogen. For example, in uh, steel making, we also have a grouping of uh, uh, the steel making uh, from hydrogen, from electrified uh, furnace, and also from traditional uh, process uh, from coke or coal, but with success. We also compare the cost, uh, where is the lowest cost? by using the uh, supply of hydrogen in China. Because all the hydrogen we show in this picture is come from the green hydrogen, not the hydrogen from the core of fossil fuels. Uh, but it's also has some opportunity, maybe there are some new technology from Canada, they are using uh, hydrogen from natural gas, uh, but uh, also it's a zero carbon emission for that one. Uh, in the meantime, it's very cheap. But basically, we are using the picture for China with the green hydrogen that's uh, come from the uh, zero emission uh, electricity. And uh, this picture show you how much additional electricity we have to use for hydrogen making and where the uh, electric come from. So, so far, uh, because this year is the turning point for solar PV in China, which is getting cheaper than coal-fired power plant, even cheaper than the existing coal-fired power plant in China. So uh, when we also have a very big picture for the nuclear. Uh, when the third generation, the fourth generation nuclear power plant comes to China, and we get much cheaper nuclear price. So this picture show you uh, how much additional electricity we need to provide hydrogen in China. Uh, and. Uh, Please also have a look. This picture is the final energy demand. Uh, the, the, this uh, is a small part of our hydrogen. It's not big share in the final energy demand. Uh, the big share is still uh, the electricity. We are putting a lot of ele electricity use in the final energy uh, demand uh, because basically uh, electricity uh, from renewable energy and nuclear is the primary energy here in China. So if anything, we can use electricity, then we go ahead with electricity. Uh, the, the sector which is difficult to use electricity, then we go ahead with the hydrogen. So this is a fundamental pictures. And another very big story is uh, in this way, we can get a very big change of economy in China because this picture show you where's a cheap, very cheap uh, solar PV uh, uh, power generation then maybe the hydrogen-based economy will have, have to move to this area, just like what we did in the, in the uh, past years. Uh, some industry already moved the area with a lot of hydropower uh, because it's cheaper, and uh, they also can be at zero carbon. So this picture could be a very big impact. That's our major working we are, uh, work we are doing right now. What's the impact on the 1.5 degree pathways on economic transition? Solar PV is getting very cheap and move very fast. This picture show you what happened in 2012 and 2013. And this picture is what happened in 2019. China is really in top of the world. Every year we are doing uh, more than 30 gigawatt. And this year can go to 40 gigawatt. In the coming uh, 14th five year plan, we are making uh, the planning uh, all solar PV plus uh, wind we are goes ahead about 100 gigawatt every year. So this is uh, happening right now, and we can rely on that. Another story is uh, actually in our scenario, we, in our scenario, we don't use hydrogen for bus, for, for car, because the, the battery-based bus could be do much better than hydrogen-based bus or car. 
and much cheaper than that one. In the meantime, our study, we are moving to next generation of the modeling. We are focused on the future uh, chemical industry, which is not only zero emission of greenhouse gases, but also their emission of air pollutant. In the meantime, they also have very small uh, toxicity. Uh, and uh, we use uh, different materials, think about our common future. That's our story for the uh, hydrogen-based uh, scenario. And uh, we are still working on that, the paper is under publishing. Okay, thank you, I finish here, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very efficient. Great. Uh, I, I like it. Uh, uh, so, uh, well, substan substantial changes. Uh, uh, I don't see any questions coming in. I have uh, kind of my own uh, 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 interest in trying to understand uh, with the current pandemic, with the COVID, uh, a lot of things are affected. Uh, what do you see? Is it going to be any changes uh, in the pace? So you've shown us very impressive numbers for solar installations and well, for uh, other renewables. Uh, do you see any effect from the COVID on that dynamics? So you think it will be kind of marching uh, at, at a similar pace? Yes, um, because our institute is under NDRC, which is a uh, planning agency. So we did a study to support the government planning. Actually, the, the, the changing of solar PV and wind, even for nuclear, is uh, based on the feasibility uh, analysis for China, whether we can do, for example, every year, 70 gigawatt of solar PV, uh, where's the space to install that? What's the grid to connect or to, to support uh, the solar PV? And also think about the hydrogen possibility where to allocate the hydrogen facilities and uh, also move the chemical industry there. Uh, so this is uh, in the modeling what we are doing right now. And uh, um, the changing phase is, uh, yes, yeah, so we also think about the learning curve of the technology. What's the, the cost the changing in the coming 10 years or 15 years? I think in the next 10 years will be very crucial for China to make the technology available example, the hydrogen-based uh, chemical industry and uh, also hydrogen-making technologies, what we are doing right now. Interesting. So, thank you. Interesting. Yeah, well, uh, again, uh, I encourage uh, people to use Q&A. Uh, well, uh, I have uh, many more questions to Jean Keijun, but unfortunately, we need to move on. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, uh, it's very interesting. And, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I was very surprised uh, by the announcement of the carbon neutrality by 2060, but it looks, well, uh, you are, you have the plan how to do that, and that's great. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you very much. So now let's move to uh, our, our next speaker. Uh, it's Khan. Yep, yeah, we see it. Yep, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. The floor is yours. Great. Um... Thank you very much for giving me a chance to talk. Um, so my talk will be a little bit different compared to the others in this session. So uh, I'm going to dive down uh, to one sector, electricity level. And uh, yeah, a little bit of a background here, um, but we have been talking about much in this conference already that to decarbonize uh, and reach the one and a half and two degree targets. We need to uh, electrify a lot, and also we do need negative emissions, most likely. As I was saying, uh, I'm focusing on electricity sector because we know that the future uh, electricity, electricity system will be wind and solar based, and that introduces a lot of intermittency that we have to take care of. And also what we have heard a lot about is that several uh, sectors are planning to electrify in one way or another, either using direct electricity or uh, hydrogen as a means to reduce their emissions. So there are several things that are not so well known yet. Um, we get many different loads uh, into the electricity system and they have different characteristics. So we don't uh, always know how they work together. Uh, we don't know how much uh, flexibility different sectors can provide. Um, so how much they can help balance the electricity system. 
And uh, it's also somewhat unclear what uh, role the biomass will play in the electricity system, as it is one of those resources that will be carbon neutral and uh, can be dispatched as we will. And finally, uh, it's also the negative emissions we've seen from uh, integrated assessment models that um, negative emissions quite often end up in the electricity system. So how does all that fit together? And uh, this study that I'm presenting here will only make into account few of those factors um, and not all the sectors and all the possible ways to electrify. So we'll look at the private transport electrification, uh, steel industry electrification via hydrogen and uh, heat sector uh, that can choose to either electrify via heat pumps or uh, use this reheating. And uh, I will also show some results on how this type of integration will affect the biomass. Now, what I wanted to show you as well as the, the effect of negative emissions uh, to the same system, but unfortunately those results are not quite really right. So what I'm going to show you uh, is a, a Another little simpler study that we've done on ducks and pecks and how do they uh, fit into an intermittent electricity system. And what we have used here is a model called Howard's to Decage, which is a heuristic optimization model that runs from 2020 to 2050 and uh, reaches zero emissions. Um, and what's a little bit special about this model is that it runs in two week segments and then um, converges and iterates to get the full yearly investments. Uh, why this is good for New Northern Europe is that we have good wind resource, so we get a wind-based system and um, cycles in wind tend to be uh, six to eight days. So uh, having representative days or uh, some other methods that I used, uh, like time slicing, wouldn't really capture those cycle effects. But otherwise, it's a model that includes quite a lot of different technologies, thermal cycling, uh, coupling to heat sector, as I've already mentioned, as well as many uh, variation management options like batteries, hydrogen, and heat storage. And what we are looking at is the Northern Europe, as you can see here on the map as well, in 12 uh, regions. And uh, I will present two scenarios, and both of those scenarios will reach 100% private electric vehicle electrification by 2050. Uh, also, 100% of the steel production in this region will be electrified by 2050, and 91% of the fossil fuel use in heating system will be replaced. Um, so, coming to the scenarios, we have looked at the two scenarios that both meet the same uh, electricity demand and provide the same services. So, the only difference between them is whether the sectors collaborate or not getting there. So, for the electric vehicles, we have the 30% uh, in collaboration case that can optimize the charging. So, they don't charge just when they come home, like in no collaboration, uh, but they can uh, move their charging in time and also uh, charge back to the grid. As for the hydrogen production for the industry, we have the collaboration case uh, storage available and the same goes for the heat. So we have more long-term storage options. And also um, when we consider the uh, replacement of the heating uh, that's currently done by natural gas in UK and Germany, so in no collaboration, we assume that it's done via individual heat pumps, whereas uh, in the collaboration case, model can choose whether it wants to use heat pumps or disk heating and electric boilers and uh, GHPs in there. So coming to some of the results. So if we look at those traditional results, the electricity produced and the capacity, we can see it that those two Scenarios don't have very different results, which is somewhat expected because they provide the same services, so roughly the same amount of energy is still needed. But what we can see is that if we have collaboration, uh, we can phase out fossil uh, uh, capacity faster and uh, basically we get rid of it totally in 2050, whereas uh, if we don't collaborate, we still have some uh, 
uh, go with CCS and bio blending uh, in the system. And we also see that we get significantly more solar in the system. That's even in Northern Europe where the solar resource is not as great. Um, and that's mainly due to the uh, flexibility in cars and the charging. So if they can uh, ch choose where they charge, uh, that helps the uh, solar capacity a lot and also reduces the need for the stationary batteries, which you can also see in the right graph here. Uh, in the collaboration uh, uh, scenario, we basically don't have any stationary batteries, so cars are taken the roll. But what we do get is a lot of other types of more seasonal storages. And that they uh, help both wind and solar integration. So another th thing that we can look at is the emissions from different sectors. And that you can see on the graph here, so how they are reduced. So on the gray graphs, you have uh, in emissions for the specific sector and how they go down uh, over the time in our scenarios. And on this uh, colorful graph, you have the, in green the average emissions of electricity production and then um, emissions for each uh, sector, the electricity that's consumed. And what we can see is that if we collaborate more, we get lower emissions in the sectors. And that's something that's been very interesting for the in industries we've been collaborating with because they, of course, want to show that their products are more sustainable and greener. So collaboration is one way to get there. But then when it comes to the use of biomass, we don't really see a significant effect. So one could think that also the use of biomass is reduced when we collaborate more between the sectors. And it is a little bit, but um, we still see large amounts of biomass used. Um, and well, here we have compared it also to the estimated potential for uh, th this part of Europe. Um, and we can see that we use uh, about 18% of the biomass available in the electricity system in those scenarios. So it's a large share. Uh, finally, moving to the negative emissions and how they fit to the uh, intermittent electricity system. So I know this is a very busy graph. And these results also come from another model that's more detailed. Um, in some aspects, so it can run the whole year. Um, but it's a green build model um, and also doesn't have a regional definitions. So we look at the one region at a time. And what we have done here is that we have included three different uh, options for providing negative emissions. So we have a uh, tax that is low temperature and uh, more flexible, so you can run in three hour cycles. We have ducts that's high temperature and um, uh, more like the conventional CCS. And then we have X uh, that can also provide negative emissions and electricity. So on the left side, two graphs, we have solar-based system. On the right side, we have wind-based system. Um, and I would like you to focus here on the lower row where we can see that we, well, we get some quite big differences. So first of all, in both cases, the base scenario, we have all the technologies available and the model uh, constantly chooses ducks over ducks and ducks uh, low temperature. Um, and uh, ducks is run when we have low electricity prices, so it consumes electricity. Uh, whereas ducks is always run uh, when the electricity prices are high. So no ducks means that the ducks is only uh, option for providing negative emissions. And what we see there, what's interesting, is that uh, if you look at the levelized cost of carbon, so the price per ton of carbon removed, uh, we see that tax is often or always more expensive in that respect than PEX. So um, we would expect PEX to be a chosen technology. But what happens there is that, well, PEX also provides electricity. And if you compare the price of electricity provided by PEX, that's much higher than the price of wind and solar electricity. So by having PEX in the system, we remove some of the wind and solar electricity and replace it by something that's more expensive. So this, and since we, provide a relatively small amount of negative emissions compared to the amount of electricity. 
this price becomes much more important. Um, so this is more of a sneak peek of the results that we've gotten. Um, just to summarize a little bit, so if we do collaborate between the sectors, we can uh, phase out fossil fuels faster. Also, we can uh, reduce the emissions for, from electricity consumptions for different uh, sectors. That's and to motivate uh, the move. Uh, the effect uh, for biomass, uh, biomass is quite uh, small, but uh, it's there, but we still need a lot of biomass. And uh, we see that that's out beyond beat specs and intermediate electricity system. And that is due to being both more flexible, but also uh, being, enabling cheaper electricity production in general. Uh, as I said, this was a very quick summary of some of the results. So if you're interested, uh, please come with me, or uh, you can also uh, read some of the papers. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you.